Good evening, everybody. I'm Fran Volkman. I'm very happy to have been asked by Mike and Jesus to be your moderator tonight. Um, has everybody got lights? No. <laughs> That's terrible. It's been a hard week. It's cold. Uh, we feel for you, and, and, and it's amazing that you're here, so thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's been a, it's been a long, hard season, uh, and it's coming to a, a conclusion now, and uh, this is perhaps the last forum that many of us will be attending before next Tuesday. Um, tonight, we're going to have a discussion about whether to repeal the Northampton Community Preservation Act or whether to save the Northampton Community Preservation Act. That's the topic of tonight's discussion. We have uh, panelists on both sides of the topic. Um, on the repeal side, we have Dave Rocklesby. Phil. Phil. Phil Rocklesby, sorry. And Dave Corbett and Jesus Leva. And on the Save the CPA side, we have Mark Wamsley and George Kohout. And we also have Catherine Baker here, who's the current chair of the CPC, the, that's the Community Preservation Committee, who's going to give an overview of what the CPC does and what it is, in case anybody needs some background on this. Because one of the things that we've found over time is that different ones of us have different understandings of what the CPA actually is and what it does. So we'd like to uh, bring everybody together tonight with a kind of common understanding of what it is, and then we can talk about whether or not we want to keep it. Um, I'm particularly happy to be here tonight because I was one of the two first elected members of the Community Preservation Committee four years ago. Lily Lombard, who's also here, and I were elected by popular vote, uh, and we have both taken that responsibility very seriously, uh, that we are here to represent all of the people of Northampton uh, and not any subgroup, uh, and, uh, and, and that's what I think we've tried to do. And in fact, when Lily began to feel as if she was moving into a position of representing a subgroup, that is Grow Food Northampton, she felt it was her responsibility to resign from the committee, which she did. Uh, she didn't have to, but that's what she did because she wanted to be sure that we were, that the elected members were not beholden to any particular side. And tonight, uh, there are also some members of the audience here who are candidates to replace Lily and me, who would, will be here if, if the CPA goes forward in Northampton, they will be members of the Community Preservation Committee, and I'd like to have them stand up so that we can all see who they are. Marlene Warren, over there, and uh, I know that uh, Dave Rothstein and... He had another commitment. He had to go, and is Mary Dockiner still here? She's, She's about here. to come in the door. She's about to come in the door. Well, he might be outside as well. Okay, anyway, and I, don't, I, I haven't seen Jim Durfer, who's the fourth candidate, but those are the four candidates. You'll be electing two of them. There's Mary. Uh, we were just introducing you. Oh, I'm glad I'm not <laughs> Is Dave open? Yes, Dave. Oh, okay. And there's Dave. So there's three of the four. Um, I've been around uh, city government and community affairs for a pretty long time, uh, at least 14 years as uh, members of the city council and the CPC and various things. And one of the things I have learned over the years is that it is how really what, what good citizens Northampton people are. Um, I don't believe there's anybody that I know who is, um, who is dedicated to doing something wrong. You know? Uh, we're here with very different, different convictions about what's right for Northampton and how we should go forward. But every one of us is here with, uh, with a conviction that we're trying to do the right thing. And I think it's important that we all remember that as we go forward. So it's, it's not the case that the pro-CPA people 
are, you know, a bunch of little insiders who are trying to do evil with the taxpayers' money. And it's not true that the anti-CPA people are all just care about themselves and don't care about community. Those kinds of generalizations just don't fly. Uh, we're all here to try to understand each other. We're going to have a respectful conversation, no zingers. Um, and we're going to disagree without being disagreeable. And we're all going to learn something in the process. So uh, the way it's going to go forward is that, uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to call on, um, by the way, I want to thank, I, I especially want to thank Mike Kirby and Jesus Leva for setting this all up, uh, for making it happen, and for Paradise City Forum for sponsoring it, uh, and for uh, Mike and uh, uh, Jesus for creating a, a something for me to follow here. So that <laughs> so thank George created that. Okay, George, thank you for whoever did this. Um, uh, so we're going to begin with an explanation of the CPA legislation and an overview of Northampton's community projects, um, and also a summary of pending legislative amendments and description of exemptions. And uh, that's going to be done for about, I think, around 15 minutes or so. Is that right? By yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to do the, um, the summary of the description of the Act and the committee, but I'm not going to talk about the specific projects. Okay. But, uh, and I will also yeah. tell a little bit about the pending legislation. Yeah. And I should also say that Joan Serafin, the assessor, is here uh, because one of the topics that has been a hot topic is uh, ex the question of exemptions for low and moderate income seniors and low income people. Uh, and so Joan will be here to address that issue if, we, if, we, if we'd like her to. Can, can Joan raise her hand so we know who she is? Hi, Joan. With no light Hi, and no Hi, Joan. Joan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to Kathy. <coughs> well, thank you, Fran, and, and um, this is a really a nice opportunity for me. I've been the, the chair of the Community Preservation Committee now for almost a year, Fran was the chair for a number of years, and uh, it's hard to fill her shoes, but I will try to give an overview of the um, history. Now, has everyone, everyone hopefully found in their chair this handout, which um, I'm going to kind of walk through with you, because I thought that would be the easiest way for you to get the basic information. And um, yeah, everybody take copies if you don't have them. We have extra copies, too. Um, so, in terms of the history, uh, the CPA law was enacted by the Commonwealth, the state legislature, in 2000. So, this is for um, 11, that was 11 years ago. And since then, it has been adopted by 147 cities and towns out of 351 in the whole state. The, uh, the way it was set up was that each town would adopt a level of um, surcharge to their property taxes, and the state would then come up with a formula for matching that. And um, I will talk to you about that in a minute. The state matching funds come from statewide registry of deeds fees. So whenever there's a real estate transaction where a fee is registered, um, there's a certain amount of money that comes from that goes into the community preservation trust fund. And over the five years that Northampton has been part of this, um, this project, we've averaged about a 50% match in local dollars, of, a match of the local dollars for Northampton. Now, if you look at uh, the attachment that's on the, the second page here, just inside the top sheet, you can see the local CPA surcharge. <coughs> Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, the state match. Look at the state match first, um, uh, which is the, the um, third page. And the first year that, that um, we were members of, that we had adopted the CPA, we were matched 100%. So we raised $714,215 from our 3% uh, surcharge, and the state matched that completely. The second year it went down to 79.63%, third year to 44.14%, last year it was 33.95%, and 
and this year it's 32.5 percent. And the reason it's been going down is because more and more towns have adopted the CPA, and so more towns and cities are drawing out of that trust fund. Um, and also because of the economy, there have been fewer uh, real estate transactions over the last four or five five years uh, since uh, 2008. So just to continue on the history here, Northampton voted to adopt the CPA with a 3% local property tax surcharge in November 2005. Um, that money began to be collected in the fiscal year 2007. So that meant there was money in our fund then to start funding projects, applications that came in. So the first funding round started in January 2008. Initially, I think there were three funding rounds, and now there are two funding rounds each year. Um, the 3% um, local property tax surcharge is the highest amount that is allowed in the Community Preservation Act. And Northampton also voted to um, adopt exemptions for the surcharge, and they are described in the uh, the second page attachment, local CPA surcharge, which you can see. Um, the first $100,000 of property value is exempt no matter uh, what your income, if, if you have a house that's worth $100,000 or $99,000 or less, there's no uh, surcharge. If it's anything over 100000 then there is a 3% surcharge. Um, and the average family pays $79 a year for that. The, there are exemptions which people have to apply uh, to the um, tax assessor for. That's Joan Serafin. And um, as you can see in the chart on the, on the, the right there, there are exemptions for moderate income limits, for seniors and low income limits um, <clears throat> owned and occupied by non-seniors. And you can see, dependent on the household size, this is specific to Northampton. Um, and apparently, according to Joan, but she, she can say more about it if she'd like to later, 618 people uh, received exemptions in this past year. Is that accurate? I think that was a little high after I investigated it. I think it was more like 370. Oh, okay, okay. But it's, that's, um, yeah, you can give us more information on that later. Okay, great. Um, okay, so then the next sec section of information that I have here is the Community Preservation Plan for Northampton. Um, we created a plan here that would be specific to our city. Everybody have that on this, it's on this front end. And the, if you want to read the text of the plan, it's at our website, which is www.northamptonma.gov slash cpc. It's about a 50-page document, very interesting, describes exactly how the Community Preservation Act should work in Northampton. It established the Community Preservation Committee and its duties, which are to receive uh, grant applications and to review them and to make recommendations to the mayor and the council. The plan also set up the review criteria for applications, who is eligible, who isn't, and the requirement for a public transparent review process for all applications. The, the Community Preservation Committee doesn't go out and solicit uh, applications from groups around town. It, it waits to receive applications. The committee is made up of nine citizen volunteers. As Fran has mentioned, two of them are elected. And as you, as you know, uh, there are four people running for two seats in the election for next week. Seven members of the committee are appointed and uh, one is appointed by the Historical Commission, one by the Conservation Commission, one from the Planning Board, one from the Recreation Commission, one from the Housing Authority, and then one each is appointed by the Mayor and the City Council. There are four project categories, and if you look on another piece of your um, handout, they're described in a lot of detail. This page here, which is called 
Community Preservation Fund allowable spending purposes. And you can see the four categories across the top. Open space, historic resources, recreational land, and community housing. And each one of those is described. And then each one of those can apply for uh, funding if they have a project that involves acquisition, creation, preservation, support, and rehabilitation and restoration. And you can see not every one of them is eligible for every one of those categories, but many of them are. Um, so in uh, the past five years, there have been 16 grants that have gone to historic preservation, 13 grants to community housing, 15 grants to open space preservation, four grants to recreation, and three grants that um, have covered multiple categories. Often that's recreation and open space or something like um, the Bean Allard Farm, which is multiple categories. The funding process, uh, when the committee meets, the committee meets twice a month on Wednesday evenings. They're all open meetings. You're all invited to come. There are two what we call rounds each year, and each round lasts for about four months. They um, start in August when uh, applicants can bring in their applications to see if they're eligible. They bring those into the Office of Planning and Development, August and January. So a round will be starting, new round will be starting this January, and um, they submit their applications with their project budgets. Uh, the committee does site visits if it's the kind of thing where you need to go look at it to see what's really involved. We meet with the applicants. Um, there, every meeting has a public comment segment to it, and there's one meeting that's almost entirely public comment. And then we talk in great depth, usually for maybe two meetings, to try to figure out what recommendations we're going to make. And then ultimately we do make recommendations, um, usually with conditions that we want to recommend funding a project with certain kinds of conditions that we think are appropriate. And then we present our recommendations to the mayor, who passes them on then to the city council. The city council votes twice on allocations of grants. Twice, um, is it every two weeks or is it every other, every other week? I can't remember how often they vote. How often does the city council meet? Two, two times a month. Okay, so they vote twice in, in order to be sure that they really want to um, uh, grant the funds to the project. And then after that, the Office of Planning and Development oversees the contracting, the payment of invoices, regular reporting, and final reports from grant recipients. Um, I just wanted to explain a little bit about the, the reports and contracts. So I want to make sure that everybody knows that the on the website, the reports and contracts, which look like they're incomplete, are incomplete because the real reports and contracts are in the Office of Planning and Development. The ones on the website are templates to show the language of reports and contracts. So the real signed contracts, they're all signed and they're all in the office. And one of the reasons they're not, the final contracts are not on the web is because there's tax ID information and things like that that don't necessarily need to be on the web. But if anybody wants to see them, they are all in the office. Sarah LaValle is our staff person. Um, let's see what else. Every grantee has three years to complete a contract unless they ask for an extension but no project has failed so far. Contracts are prepared after the council approves the project. Staff prepares a draft, including the special conditions that the CPC has included in its recommendations. Contracts are then sent to applicants for signature. Then they're sent back to the city for signatures by the Community Preservation Committee, the director of the Office of Planning and Development, the chief procurement officer, the auditor, and the mayor. All those sign all the contracts. Any changes to the contract requested by the applicant must be approved by the Community Preservation Committee. The payments depend a lot on the project, how the payments happen. Invoices detailing work completed are typically required. And they are submitted to the Office of Planning and Development staff who refer to the contracts to be sure that 
any reporting and any other conditions have been met before the payment is authorized. There's an exception to this, um, the invoice paying, um, when acquisition projects where the full payment is held until closing, the final closing, if, say, land is being bought or buildings are being bought. Um, so the leveraging of CPA funds is the last thing on this list here. Um, local revenue we've over um, five years has been $3.8 million. It has been raised from that surcharge. And it's generated $24.3 million in funding, 51 projects over five years. Projects are all over uh, all the wards in the city. Um, when the CPA is the first in with a local project, a first contributor to a project, additional grants from the state, federal programs, private foundations, and other donors have been very responsive. Um, I just wanted to also add a little information about the new CPA Act that's in the legislature right now. And this is described on the last piece of the handout that you have here. It's, um, this is the state of this act in November 2011. Right now, um, um, it is in the House Ways and Means uh, Committee and has received a favorable report from the Joint Committee on Community Development and Small Business. It will go out of Ways and Means, it will go to the House for a vote and then to the Senate. It's very popular. If you can see, there are 114 sponsors, both Democrats and Republicans in the legislature for the new act because it is um, um, creating a lot of local <coughs> jobs. The local job component makes it very popular. Um, and uh, let's see what else I wanted to tell you about. There, there are three, three goals in the, the new legislation. They're trying to clean it up and make it better than the 2000 act. One is that the state match is going to be consistently at 75%. Um, and that's explained in this attachment. Uh, so there won't be the fluctuation that there has been. Two is um, they're making a change in the requirement uh, for no maintenance projects, particularly for um, recreation fields and parks. And in the new legislation, because uh, there was a lot of complaint about that, the restoration and rehabilitation of old fields and parks will now be okay. And there are also some components in here that make it more um, attractive to cities participate because um, a number of cities are not participants yet. Um, the gaming legislation amendment um, that was passed by the House would donate some of their licensing fees and other revenue to the CPA. This particular amendment has not yet been attached to the Senate version of the gaming bill, but they are now in conference and our hope is that that amendment will be included because then it will fast track the CPA bill because the CPA bill would then have to ask for less money um, if that gaming revenue were included. That's all I have for basic information. Okay, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, so we could take just a minute. If anybody has a, a, a question of information about what Catherine has said, not not a, we're not ready to debate yet, but do. You, do you have a question of information? Was there anything that wasn't clear that you would like Catherine to elaborate on? Okay, then. Actually, yes. You said that some of the documents have left some of the information off on these. Would that also include the, the bid record? Would that not be included? I don't think you have the right document. This is the document that I oh, no, no, no. But I was just wondering that when you had said that, uh, that some of the documents that are on the website. Oh, on the blank. website. Those are templates. The templates? Yeah. Would that also include the bid record? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. um, yeah but this so, is so the open, actual bid record. Whenever there's construction, there's an open bidding process. You have to have three bids for everyone, just, just like a city. But the actual information would be done at the yeah. planning. The process. thing to do is to go and talk to, uh, if you want to see the contracts, is Sarah LaValle, who is our staff person. Yeah. Uh, Mike? Mike? Yeah. I just wondered why. Okay, pardon me. It just doesn't seem logical to put the empty templates on the website. It seemed to me to, 
to black out the critical information like the tax ID number. Um, but essentially, I, read, I look at the website and there's nothing on there really other than the initial application and the letters of recommendation. Why was the decision made? Well, I'm just basically giving you information about how it's done now. If you think that that ought to change, one of the things I didn't say is that the plan, the CPA plan, is re, um, reviewed and reevaluated uh, uh, every two years. So we did it in 2010. We're going to do it again in 2012. And I think in public comment meetings around evaluating the plan, that would be a great suggestion. Uh, I mean, I think I, I can't explain the whys right now. I'm just telling you what, what it is. Right. It doesn't mean that we don't have contracts because they're not up on the web. Right. So I think that's a great idea to bring into one of our evaluation meetings. And if they will all be publicly posted when the evaluations are happening. Is it, is it permissible for me to add something? As a moderator, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll call what happens to this? What happens to the to the funded projects after they leave the CPA? They go into a set of city rules. Uh, the CP the CPC does not make a decision about what can go up on the website beyond its own activities. Um, there are things that the city will and won't put up on the website because of issues of confidentiality or whatever that the CPC has no control over. Okay, let's move along then. Um, so now we're going to move into the pros and cons of whether we ought to repeal this act. Thank you so much for giving us the background, Catherine. Um, and we will have uh, brief presentations from the panelists. Uh, we will have the pro panelists first, that is the people who say yes, we should repeal the CPA in Northampton, um, the three panelists. Uh, we're giving the panelists on each side a total of 10 minutes. So you can divide up your 10 minutes however you like. Um, would you like for me to give you a you little... Take uh, up the rear. Okay. Uh, shall I give you a, 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 a time at the end of three minutes so that you kind of know where you are? I'm uh, sure. Yeah, okay then. All right, who's going to be first? Okay, Jesus is going to be first. Well, I guess I'd like to start by saying that I think that with the Community Preservation Act, which uses one of its main funding sources as the property tax base, we're trading one set of problems for another set of problems. I think that people have identified things in the community that they want to see done in terms of affordable housing, open space preservation, um, but what we're not looking at is really what it means when we change the property tax base. Um, one of the things that I actually just talked with the, at the assessor's office um, just this afternoon is what happens when a nonprofit takes a taxable piece of property off of the tax roll. And of course, that particular nonprofit is no longer paying property tax because nonprofits are property tax exempt. That value is then redistributed to other people's property taxes throughout the city instead. So the $79 dollars on average for each individual that we're saying that the CPA is costing people doesn't really reflect all of the different parameters of what happens as a result of the CPA. The other thing I'd like to say is that there's a state funding dynamic as well. With, with the state side of it, the money comes from the registry of deeds fees that are collected from all communities throughout the state. but not all communities participate in it. So communities that are poor generally do not pass the CPA because of the property tax surcharge, because they're low to raise property taxes in their community. Some of those communities are Holyoke, 
Springfield, and Chicopee, and actually most of Western and Central Mass. So these are our neighbors. And there is a definite, even if we are, if, even if we pass and even if we're benefiting from it, we still end up losing from it if the rest of our economic base in the region is suffering as a result of these kinds of inequities. And we're spending a lot of time focusing our energy on, you know, some of these state initiatives to try to get the state to provide 75% matching when, and creating this sort of new burden that the state has to carry for, I guess what I would say, in a lot of ways, are non-essential expenditures when we know that there are specific pieces of our own budget and other cities' budgets that are hurting. It's three minutes. Um, no, I'll pass that next uh, I'm Phil Brockwisty. I live here in Northampton. Uh, bought a house here in, I think, 96. Unfortunately for the former owner, they were in foreclosure. Luckily for me, I picked it up at a good price. Um, I have friends of mine <coughs> that have uh, family members that make pretty decent money every year, about 70 grand a year. His fellow sister started looking in Northampton and realized, yeah, it was 70, 60 to 70 grand a year, I probably could afford to buy a house. And then she started looking at the long range costs and the taxes and the forever ongoing spiraling water and sewer and uh, all the other incremental costs that come along. And she realized she really couldn't afford to own a house in Northampton. Uh, I was against the CPA from the beginning. Um, I think people have it good in their mind to preserve open space. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. But when you actually look at the long-term costs of it, the less space there is to put buildings on, that makes the buildable areas just escalate in costs. And for somebody to want to move here and build a, an affordable home on an affordable piece of property, that just doesn't happen because there's less property to build on the more open space you preserve. It ends up where somebody buys a piece of property for a hundred grand, and then they end up with a four or five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar house on it. Like I said, the idea behind open space is a good idea. Unfortunately, it really increased the cost to anybody who wishes to remain here, to move here, to build here. Um, it was also along the lines of uh, low income housing. When you think about it, it's a wonderful thing too. Unfortunately, when we start adding costs onto people that own property who are landlords, they just don't meet the costs. They pass those on to their tenants, raising the rates of rent. People can't afford their rents then. And, and you know, it, it, this whole thing started off as a very good idea. Unfortunately, over a long-term process of thinking it out, you realize that it's actually as really increase the cost for for people to live here to get to a point where it's unaffordable for them. Um, I also have some qualms about the way the, the whole thing is done. There, there's uh, People aren't required, once they get their money, they aren't required to go back and show, yes, this is what I spent it on. Uh, there's no way for, uh, there's no checks and balances in the end. When somebody gets their money for a project, they don't have to go back a year later and say, this is where I spent the money. Here's my proof. Wait a minute. That I know of. <laughs> that I know of. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong after, but uh, but also uh, there have been times where projects have changed, uh, such as the Maple uh, Standing Room Only, uh, the Standing Room Only, SRL, Single Room, room Occupancy. Uh, it was supposed to be originally an ex expanded SRO where they were each going to have a kitchen and a bathroom in each unit. That never came through. That all changed with $250,000 of, of CPA money. They ended up with a community kitchen and three bathrooms for, I believe, 11 apartments. And, and that was done, to me, it was haphazard. It, was, it shouldn't have been done that way. It, they should have had to come back and explain what happened and what went on. Um, I just see a lot of questions in it. I'm sure people will be asking questions tonight, and hopefully we can fill in more. Your turn. I'm David Corbett, lifelong resident. 
hopefully I'll finish that term one day in about 30 years. Um, I grew up on Fordale Terrace, bought my parents' house, still live there. I've got uh, neighbors now that uh, I can say that I grew up with their grandfather, two young kids. I knew their great-grandmother, I can tell them stories about them. I knew their great-great-grandmother. So they've been there for a long time. They've talked about moving, possibly because of the escalating loss of various things. I've got a neighbor that's uh, 92 years old, a renter for 45 years. She doesn't have a pro uh, possibility of getting an exemption. Fortunately, she has a fantastic landlord, the old type of landlord, who put a new heating system in for her to make sure her costs stay down. And so they're still around. Myself and my wife, we own my family home from when I was a kid. One of the things when I bought the house was to tell the, my mother that we'll keep the second floor tenant as long as we can. He's still there, going on about 35 years. We haven't gone up on a rent in five years. This year we finally had to tell them to take their own trash because it's getting so expensive and unknown costs. They have a tenant with a family that she was <coughs> pregnant when she moved in. The daughter just went off to college. They had oil for heat. The cost was so great. My wife took her savings and put a brand new 94% efficient boiler in there. Didn't go up on her rent because we were able to eat it. I ended up taking my social security this year. so. I can avoid going up on a rent. But again, they take their trash to the dump. I remember uh, recreation years ago. It was a veteran's field right behind the house. Every summer, you were able to go down there. They had two counselors. I believe the lady that's in charge of the senior center was a counselor at one time. Nice, clean recreation, not too expensive. Mm -hmm gave jobs to the college kids during the summertime. It was fantastic. I see a lot of this that I think can be used for other things. I look at the paperwork on the CPA. It says about uh, the city owning real property. The city has to own it, but it can be managed by someone else. I see on here that you can't cut any trees, grass, or anything else without permission on any land They're using CPA dollars. I see the South Street School with a big tree just being taken down. I don't know if I, I didn't hear anything about going to the city. I see the Academy of Music, money going into there. Oh, that's it? Well, no. you can finish. Okay. <laughs> going into the Academy of Music, I see this big sign out in front, a billboard. That's not historic. The building the way it was was historic. Now you've got to end up with a parking lot in the park next door. Cars going around, parking all the way up to the playground structure. You know, there's other ways we can use this money that people will appreciate it better. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Okay then, um, now we're ready to move over to the, the people who are voting no, let's not repeal. The CPA, and uh, I think who the first speaker will be. Could, could I interrupt for just a second? Sure. This, this very mini camera, the only one available at Northampton Community Television, and I'd love to get a good shot. But I wonder if there's a way I can put more light in that corner. Um, I'm I already have my hat off. You're doing great. <laughs> and you're a I'm trying to be blind. I'm trying to be I don't know if those are. I don't know. Yes, they are. Sorry, it's yeah. oh. That's on now. That's as good as I can get. Huh? What about these? Do they, they not work? I just don't know how. Well, so this it's is probably one light. of those three lights, right? That's outside. Are all those three outside? Sadly, sadly, sadly yeah. those have no bulbs in them. No. Oh, so <laughs> that's all good. Okay, well, I'll just. Sorry about that. It'll be a little grainy, it'll be shady. Yeah, that's okay. all. Okay, so the, the first speaker uh, on the no side. Uh, will be George Kohout. Hello, yep. Hello, everyone. My name is George Kohout. Um, I want to again thank uh, the Paradise City Forum, Mike and Jesus, for 
sponsoring this event and helping organize it, and the Civic Association here, the Florence Business and Civic, for letting us use this nice place. Um, <clears throat> so I've lived in the Northampton area for about 30 years, not quite as long as some of my friends over there. 20 years up in Leeds, my two boys went to Leeds Grammar School, um, graduated from Northampton High School, and they since moved on. Um, so I've seen prices change too, no doubt about it. We, we live in a very changing world for the past 30 years. Um, I'm unabashedly an avid fan of the CPA, the Community Preservation Act. Um, and I'll be honest to tell you that I served on the committee for four years. And I was one of the organizers for the original campaign to get it adopted here. Um, I also am on the board of the Leap Civic Association which received a grant after trying twice and received it the second year, and I'll talk more about that later perhaps. But just so you know some of my background, I might come a little bit biased to this event. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here tonight because um, the people who put forward the petition kind of threw down the gauntlet, so to speak, to say let's have an open discussion, and so here we are. We're glad to do it. Um, there are the Anything that's been around for five, six years as a process needs to be re-examined and talked about. I think that's fair, especially with all the discussion about best practices here in Northampton. So we're, we're doing that, and I think it's a great, it's a great opportunity for all of us. Um, my comments here were mostly kind of phrased and thought about to try to get information out to those of you in the audience who may be undecided about how you're going to vote. Is there anybody out there who's undecided tonight? So, I'm going to throw my stuff away. Um, so, so, but maybe there's a few people on the fence that I hope some of my comments can help you understand what the benefits are to the CPA, or maybe what are some of the negative impacts have been. Um, I think there's really three important factors of the CPA and how it's been implemented in Northampton, because different towns and cities implement the legislation differently. I think we've done a wonderful job here in CPA. When I look around the city at the way other towns and uh, other around the state, how other towns and cities have done it. Um, as was mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation, the, one of the biggest factor is my contribution and your contribution. If you're a, a taxpayer, a, a homeowner, um, goes to the to the city tax collector, and it, for every dollar that I put in, it leverages six more dollars from out of the city through other funds, through the state match, through other grants. I don't get that kind of payback anywhere else from my contribution. Um, and that's a great thing that I think we're fortunate to take advantage of. So without boring you with numbers, you know, it was about close to $4 million that the, um, the taxpayers of Northampton have contributed so far, and we've brought in about $24 million. That's pretty good math, $6 to one. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. The second big point that I want to emphasize is the, the real openness and um, kind of transparency, I know that's quite a buzzword, of the whole process and uh, the application and the selection process that the Northampton Committee has really developed um, since the beginning and worked hard to maintain. The, the process for applying for the project funds, the evaluation of these project applications by the committee, and the recommendations to fund or not to fund certain projects, it's the, it's the most informed process that I've been part of. And, and I've got some experience. I, I was on the planning board for 10 years. I was on the capital improvements um, program in the city for four years. Um, I was a member of the housing partnership, member of the LEED Civic. My job is to write grants and screen grants. So the process that we've developed here to me, it was really obnoxious at times. They were so stringent about some of their um, openness. Now, certainly there was a question raised in the audience earlier, could we do more? And maybe we can, about making things available to people on the internet. Um, but at any time, any project, anyone in Northampton can look at documents, and they can go to meetings and ask questions. They can go to the planning office also and look at those. My last point is, uh, just that there's so much that all of us want to pass on to our children or perhaps future generations in Northampton. And these things that, that are really important to pass on, such as open space, recreational opportunities, affordable <coughs> housing options for all income levels, 
that are funded by the CPA can't be funded anywhere else by the city budget. We need to do this now. We need to keep funding the CPA so we can continue to move these things forward. And with that, I'll That's close. your Thanks. five minutes, George. Oh, no! <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Well, that's okay. That's all right. That's you can get five minutes, too. It, excellent. Yes. Well, you said there's no zingers allowed, so my presentation got much shorter. I see. Uh, that's <laughs> good to hear. So I'm going to tell you when you've done four minutes and 30 seconds. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> okay, I'll talk quickly. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see all of you, especially if there's a mic, to see all of you. I think we've all missed that for a while. Um, just something about myself, my name is Mark Walmsley. Um, I have varied connections with the CPA. I should say that I'm involved with two groups that have benefited from the CPA, the David Ruggles Center for Early Florence History and Underground Railroad Studies, as well as the Nonatuck Land Fund. Um, so that's one of the ways I got acquainted with the CPA. Uh, and actually, uh, it's really nice to be back here because our earliest meetings for the David Ruggles Center were in this room, so it always feels very welcoming. It was very grassroots. Uh, grassroots type of project, like many CPA projects, start as. Uh, I come here as a Florence resident. I am a homeowner. I started out as a renter. So I, too, have had to deal with the costs of uh, owning a home and paying rent. And, What's a very nice place to live? I think that really comes down to one of the reasons why the rent and home prices are so high. Is it's really a wonderful community to live in. Um, and I've certainly enjoyed many of the projects that the CPA has supported around the city. So really, I'm not an expert on the CPA, but I would call myself very much an enthusiast of the CPA, like George. Um, I'm also a bit of an idealist, but also a bit of a realist, and I think the CPA is actually a wonderful law in that respect, because it really supports both sides of that. And I'll get into that a little bit. But uh, in deciding to join to this panel, a real strange thing happened to me, in that I found myself thinking more about the people that I've dealt with than the places that the CPA usually supports. I absolutely support things like protecting farmland and woods, which provide all of us things like food, clean air, clean water. Um, I support uh, saving places that allow us to learn about our history. I support having places for our less advantaged residents to live. Um, and all those places, and places to recreate certainly, they all play a part in building our community. But over the years, I've found that the community in the Community Preservation Act is really more than the sum of all those different areas. Uh, I've met some of the most wonderful, dedicated individuals that I know as they worked to bring people together in order to secure CPA funding and do wonderful things in this city. Uh, that work was all volunteer. It usually involved putting in long hours after people's day jobs, writing grants, uh, building local support, sometimes physically building things like trails and renovating houses. And to me, that's the type of community that the CPA encourages people uniting in a common purpose. So that's the idealist side. Um, there are also some great side benefits that I've learned about the CPA, because people also bring their creativity and their vision to projects. So it's wonderful to save a place like the Bean and Allard Farms. But the CPA also required residents to think ahead about what role those properties were going to play in Northampton's future. So now we have a CSA farm that donates to the local food pantry. We have plans for a community garden. And hopefully we'll have a new recreational facility in Florence Fields. And all that was spurred from what was once a crisis, when Northampton was about to lose one of its iconic and most historic pieces of farmland. We got all that value added by this going through the CPA process. So I think that's really pretty good. Um, and all told, it's led me to conclude that the CPA is one occasion where the government has actually gotten something right. Uh, there's always been a recurring need in towns and cities across Massachusetts to make projects like these possible. And a very thoughtful law was crafted to meet those needs. And it's a law that supporters actively try and improve to make it a positive force and not be a burden on those who can't bear the burden. And by any standard, it's been incredibly successful, both here and across Massachusetts. Uh, we heard the numbers before, and more towns and cities are adopting it every year. None who have adopted it have ever repealed it. And even fewer, well, few have also reduced the number from 3% down to a lower percentage. So it's been massively popular. 
30 seconds. Yeah, 30, 30 seconds, <laughs> excellent. Okay, all that being said, um, if I've had one thing con confirmed to me over the years, both living in Northampton and living in other places around the country, it is the truism that it's much harder to build something than it is to tear it down. So I really hope that the people of Northampton choose to vote no on repealing the CPA next week, and that they choose to keep this great resource, resource and all the, all the opportunities it provides, and to not tear it down. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, then. Uh, so now it's time uh, to move along to um, the questions uh, that you all might have. Um, I ask you to, um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep a balance so that we have questions for this side and then that side, and you know, um, and uh, try to keep your questions crisp. Um, I'm not going to say you have to do it in 30 seconds or something, but just don't carry on, please. And then you will, um, each side will have two minutes. If, if a question goes to you, you'll have two minutes, any of you, to answer it. And then you'll have one minute to comment. And if the question goes to you, you'll have two minutes to answer it, and you'll have one minute to come. Okay? Okay, who would like to ask a question? Well, um, since this is an education forum, and yeah, are you asking? I'm, I'm actually asking Catherine to clarify for the, the participants in the audience here um, the process by which a grant recipient receives CPA funds. Is it a case where, as, um, as might have been representative, represented, that they get a pot of money when they're awarded the money, and, and when they're awarded the fund, and then sort of like everybody turns away and, and you know, there's no more eyes on the way the money is spent. Can you clarify that for us? I can give you my experience of being on the committee through two rounds. One is a, a, a group has a project that they think meets the qualifications that you all have. You have the, that allocation of uses form. And they um, bring their proposal to the Office of Planning and Development, which uh, Sarah Lavalley, our staff person, looks at it and shares it with the chair of the committee and decides whether or not it's eligible. And then that application goes to a meeting of the full committee in which the committee also decides about whether to take it on. And they get a chance to read the application through. This last August, we had nine applications in August, and six of them were considered eligible. And the committee got all six applications. And some of them are pretty thick. There's a lot of detail. The budget is in there, all the elements of the project. And then we read those very carefully, and we have questions. Um, we always have questions, the nine members of the committee, and we write them out, and um, the, all nine sets of questions go to the, um, I have to, only two minutes to explain yeah, myself. You have less uh, actually, Catherine, oh, my, my, my question was at, at the point at which the grant is okay, awarded. Okay, the grant is awarded. Okay. At that point, um, the, um, we, we recommend, we don't, we don't award. The city council votes that yes, they get it. At that point, it goes back to the staff which drafts a contract. Uh, the, the OPD staff will draft a contract, which then has to be approved by the people that I mentioned before, um, and then signed by the CPC, the OPT, the chief procurement officer, the auditor, and the mayor. At that point, there is, with conditions and everything, there's a contract. And then when they start their project, they submit invoices to the Office of uh, Planning and Development. And can I just finish you my sentence? You can finish your sentence. I can finish my sentence. And the, if the invoices are paid if the, uh, if the project has fulfilled all the agreements that, uh, that were in the conditions and in the contract. And at the end, they have to write a complete financial a narrative report of what they have done before they get their any final um, payments for those invoices. Yes. I have a question, um, and I'll be direct about it. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm supposed to let the other side have oh, a minute okay. to respond. Can I respond to that? I'm not on either side, though. I'm just well, trying to just have a question yeah. on it. Yeah. 
Catherine is presumably not on either side, so, but anyway, oh, you go ahead. I had a, a question on it that I've heard, I don't know for a fact, that there were like $94,000 left over from the Bean Allard farm that re got reallocated before it went back to the CPC committee. Could you comment on that? Um, I don't know. I wasn't there during that time, but again, I think, Dave, as it was mentioned by the chair, the, uh, the CPC follows all of the practices um, of the city government. So whatever the, the financial folks, the auditor and the treasurer have laid out for those other accounts or vendors, it happens the same way. I would think if that money wasn't expended, it goes back into the pool of the CPC fund, back into the silo for the recreational funds, the open space, or the historical preservation. Um, it wasn't, I, normally it wouldn't be turned back to the Bean Allard um, people who are implementing that project to use as they see fit. Okay, next question. Um, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, you can answer your question, then I'll ask you. Rock, paper, scissors. Good one. I know. I was lost. It would be helpful also to identify each, each of you. Identify I have a suggestion. If people <coughs> are having a difficulty hearing, we can all move forward a couple of rows. Got to run in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Mark. Right. I'm Jeff Massimino. I, um, first of all, I'd like to say I agree with you guys. I, you know, I like to open. I like outdoors. I'm an outdoors kind of guy. I do a lot of camping and stuff like that. Um, I think one thing that people have a problem maybe with the CPA is that it's kind of what these guys have mentioned, the property tax implications. Even though it might only be $79 average to people's bills, some folks $79 is a lot of money. And I think one question I do have is how come there was no discussion about, well, let's keep it maybe lower down to like 1% or 2%. Maybe we could have put that on the ballot instead of just, you know, just a repeal or no, have it or not have it. Um, and what do you guys think about something like that? Are you addressing this question to Sorry. the no I people or the yes people? <laughs> the no people. Both of them. Both. 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 Okay. But we'll start with the no people. Okay. So, um, Jeff, good question. When the original people back in 2005 decided to pretty much go for broke with their um, the enabling legislation, we realized that at 3% we would get the city of Northampton the biggest bang for our contribution. It also entitles you to a larger match share from the state when they come to um, match their payments, as opposed to a community, for example, like Hatfield, who's only at 1%, they don't get more than one round of funding. Those communities that are in at 3% get more value for their dollar. Um, that's kind of the straightforward answer about the 1%, 2 or 3%. The, the, the property tax, well, I, I missed your kind of the second part of the question, Jeff, but that's on the that's 1 and the 2 and the 3%. That's okay. I, I mean, they, they think the other thing I was kind of more curious about, not to ask two questions at once, but um, the matching, the 6 to 1, I wasn't sure how that was all coming from. And how, what it actually is the level at now? It's not 6 to 1 anymore, right? It's Could, 1 to 1. I'm yeah. sorry. So would you mind if we separate those questions? And oh, go ahead absolutely. and let's, let's let both sides deal with the, 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 the percentage, and we'll get back to the leveraging later. So would you all like to comment on? I, I, I definitely like to comment on the $79 on average. Um, um, again, that's an average. Um, that's, it's different for, you know, different people because every, you know, year the assessors, you know, reassess property values in the city and the total amount of property value in the city can only increase by a certain amount, but where that is increased uh, is, is different and for some areas it actually might be decreased. And again, with a lot of these CPA projects, they're taking property off the tax rolls. So when that happens, the value, like let's say there was a property that was bought up by a nonprofit for affordable housing, and it was previously taxed at, I don't know, $50,000. That money doesn't go away from the tax base. It's instead distributed to people's property values throughout the city. Those 
still taxable properties. Um, I, I think we can we can ask Joan just to make sure. Should I answer? Sure. Okay. Um, any property that's taken off the rolls, um, then then the rest of the people in the city take up that slack because we're going to raise the same amount of money. We're usually at our, at our levy limit. It's only occasionally we haven't met the levy limit. And so we're going to raise the same amount of money regardless how many properties do come off the rolls. I think he's talking about when it goes off the rolls to an exempt status. Okay. Does that clarify? Yeah. And, and as I understood it, you were also asking, Jeff, uh, about the 3% surcharge rather than a, a lower amount. Did, yeah, did you all want to address that? Why, did you, why didn't you lower the amount line. instead of uh, asking for a repeal? Well, when I first started and I started taking a petition around, we didn't help get any help from the city uh, officials so people could have their rights to vote. And it was out of frustration maybe that we didn't ask for a lower percentage. But I tell you, it was not hard to go out and get over a thousand signatures. People have a lot of questions. You've seen a lot of questions at the forum up at JFK when the candidates were out there. And it's just uh, was a lot of work as far as, um, not a lot of work, I made it easy. I passed out over 20 uh, petitions and uh, people got them back to me full. Um, and that was our goal, just to get it on so we could talk about it. And people were reluctant to talk about it on the city end. Well, Very we're reluctant. here tonight to talk about it, so, so uh, let's... And it took... Yeah. Getting it on the ballot to get the conversation going. Okay. It wasn't anything anybody else did. Uh, yes, sir. You know, I'm Andrew Kowalski, and I live in Northampton, of course. And um, I've been retired for 17 years, and I think you people are talking to the wrong person when you're trying to talk to me about it. Are you people retired yet? The three on the board there, are you both working? Yes, I you got good jobs. Work. You got okay. <clears throat> you don't understand what it is for a person that just reached that maximum where you can get a a leeway on paying this CPA. I can't really, and I've tried to save a few bucks to try to have a healthy life for myself. In the city, it's tough living in the city. I've lived here all my life. I went to the school system in Northampton. And I think the life was good then, too. Everybody says life is good now. I think the life was good there. If I had to put my money on it, I think the life living was living better when I was younger growing up than it is now. Everything's too expensive. The water bill keeps going up. This is what hurts. The water bill. Your taxes keep going up. When your tax bill goes up, the CPA goes up. When you first started this five or six years ago, your big gimmick on passing this was you were going, the state was going to give maximum what you collect. And you pushed, it was only going to be something like $30, $30 or something like that. It was a ridiculous figure. That was six years ago. Now the way inflation goes and your property taxes have gone up has mushroomed down to 79 To tell you the truth, I'm paying more than $79 than you people say. And it's just like her. You're buying up this property. That's off the tax roll now. We don't, the city don't get taxes. They said they didn't get much for that property anyway. But still, you're taking tax dollars off of the tax dollars that's helping us lower our taxes. Are you people trying to get what I'm trying to understand? I love the way you talk about your side of it. Very good. I thought that was very good. I feel sorry. I feel like crying. I feel like giving them a million dollars to you people. But I can't. 
I hope you know what I'm trying to understand, trying to prove to you. And that's my idea of this whole thing. I just don't like the way you people are spending your money either. That property that somebody mm -hmm. talked over here, right by uh, uh, the barber shop over here, that was a disaster, that program. That was a disaster. They, the council even had problem with it. The city, the, the council, the way that money was being spent. They were upset about it. Okay, I think, I think it, you have to sort of wrap this well, up. Well, I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Can you make All a right. comment on that? Uh, so I think your question was addressed to the no people. So uh, let's give you guys a couple of minutes. To oh, yeah. There was a question there. I'd like to answer. There's a lot packed into yes. that statement. <laughs> so I'm going to take part of it, and if I can cede some time to George. Okay, well. that's um, fine. You have two minutes. The taking property off the tax roll issue has come up a couple times here, and I just want to address that. I, I'm actually curious to know how often that's actually happened via the CPA. Um, a lot of these, a lot of the CPA money is going to improvements and not to purchasing properties. Uh, I know of a couple areas that I'm particularly I'm most familiar with land conservation. And when you're talking about something like land conservation, there's a number of different ways to conserve a piece of property, and it doesn't always take it off the tax rolls, especially if you put a conservation restriction on it, as opposed to buying it outright in fee. So I think it's a little more complicated than people are certainly saying. Um, also, there's another side to it too. Reports have come out, a number of reports have come out, looking at what happens to land that is conserved and how it affects the tax roll of the town. And it turns out the most expensive thing that you can do for a piece of land for a town is to build a bunch of houses on it. And it's tough to say because when you build houses, you have families and you have kids. And what is the biggest expense to a city but the school system? And report after report have shown that it's actually not, it doesn't really take that much money away from the town to protect land. It actually is much more expensive if you let that land be built upon. So, those are my data, so I'll see you in the remaining time to George. Just, just real quickly, Henry, I, I, I hear what, a lot of what you're saying. I'm specifically around the project in Florence. There's been 50 to 51 projects on the CPC. Um, any organization, any movement that has that amount of work, there's always going to be a few projects that don't quite meet the snuff of, of a large group of people. I'd love to talk to you at some point about specific other projects that even you would applaud, like the Forbes Library, the Lilly Library, um, repairing the roof of the first churches, um, a number of things that have really done our community a great deal. There's, there's going to be a couple of others that will stick in our cross. <clears throat> Would you all like to have a, a minute? Well, I just want to mention something about the $79 average for the city. And if you take a property like Laurel Park, where the mayor lives up there, the land is separate. It's not taxed. Or there's a $100,000 exemption for the land. And when those people get done, they're paying on $50,000 that will bring your average down real quick. So the average homeowner in a $300,000 house is paying a lot more than $79. No. No. Hmm? All right. Thank you. I have a $356,000 house. Yeah. My fee is not much more than $79. Oh, who do you know? <laughs> uh, okay, let's, uh, let's move along. Do, does somebody want to make this into a question? Did we finish our whole question? No, you had 16 seconds left. Yeah. I did want to say that you are correct that uh, open space is, is more sustainable for a community because you don't have the expenses of schools. The only problem is, is then it becomes an elitist community where they're only building $400,000 houses. And there's not a lot of $115,000, $125,000 houses going in as they're too expensive to buy the property alone, but let alone build. That's the one problem with that. Uh, let's see if there's anybody who hasn't raised it. <coughs> yes, Mom. Um, I have a question, I guess, for both sides. I'll start with uh, pro side. Could you talk a little bit more? When I talk about this uh, leveraging concept, uh, people sometimes their eyes glaze over. Um, the word leveraging, I think, is not commonly understood of what that means. So the question about six to one. Talk more about what 
use other words besides leveraging to describe what, what's going on here. When we put $1 in, how are we getting $6 back? So, um, Matt? So, well, I'll give you a concrete example again. The first church is down in uh, Northampton. They um, applied for a grant. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but let me use it. Say $200,000 to help totally um, replace their roof. That was, um, the total project number was $200,000. Of that, they asked the, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee to fund $50,000. And again, don't quote my numbers here. It's been a couple of years since that grant came through. But they had to show other funders throughout the state, historical preservation groups, other, the, uh, you know, the, the Kittredge Foundation, they had to show them a community contribution before any of those other groups would even look at their grant applications. So first they said, if your community is the first in, as Catherine Breaker referred to earlier, with $50,000 in that area, we will then kick in our $50,000. You'll be able to get $50,000 from the Historical Preservation Group in Boston, and on and on. So our smaller contribution of 50 leveraged, kind of picked up that project so more and more money could be put into it. Without our money to start that little effect, none of the other money would have come in. And the, the great ripple effect of that is that that project, being a construction project, then brought in jobs um, to the local area. Those men and women bought food in the cafes. There's this whole economic kind of impact that those projects have, which is, again, leveraging more of a positive impact for our community in Northampton. So I think that's a better way to use that term leverage. It helps to crank things up and get other funds to support projects. Okay. Well, I kind of look at leverage, and where does that money come from? It comes from the state, but where does the state get it? From our school budgets? from our road repairs, from our national debt, keep on going up and up and up. If it's state money, it doesn't grow on a tree. Federal money doesn't grow on trees. It comes from somewhere. Yeah, I guess I'd like to elaborate on that. Um, I think that some of the money that we're leveraging, I mean, some of it might be private grants, but large portions of it are state and federal grants. I mean, we can see that with the rail trails. Um, most of that money came from federal stimulus money. And we have a $24 million backlog in you know, road repairs for the DPW. And we're, instead of seeking the money for those things that are most critical to us, keeping the school you know, budget level funded, road infrastructure, economic development, we're instead using this to leverage money for a lot of non-essential spending. And I think you see a lot of people in the community getting frustrated. And that's why, even though the CPA itself is a very small pool of money, you're, you're finding a lot of community frustration is being taken out right at this level because it's the only money that I think people in the community feel like they have any control over. Okay. Uh, Marlene. Um, I want to get back to one of the first questions. I just. Um, my question is, um, Ms. Baker, I think is your name, Catherine Baker, you said that there is a final report. Um, well, I did some investigating, and I saw that, and I spoke with Sarah, and I spoke to other people that spoke to um, Wayne Feiden, and Wayne Feiden said that a final report isn't required. Sarah told me that a final report is not required, but oftentimes people do give a final report, but also, what she said is she receives invoices uh, from people. So my question is, if you're only, for instance, in a construction project, if all you see are the invoices of the project, and you consider that a final uh, accounting, how do you get the full picture of whether um, it was a reasonable um, expenditure when you don't know how much people were getting paid or how much of all of the total picture of the construction project, how can that be, how can you say that you have an accounting when all you know is you receive some invoices? So you really don't know what the total cost of the project was because of the other funding um, 
sources. So my point is, you really don't know. Um, you don't know how much the, uh, the contractor was getting paid, for instance, when all you're doing is getting the invoices. When, because if they only use the CPA dollars to pay the invoices, you really don't know how much people are getting paid. Now, I'm not saying we have to throw the CPA out because, because of this information or because we don't have this information. What I'm saying is that the, it could be improved so that maybe we could, we could justify and people wouldn't say, well, how much is that contractor getting paid? You know? So, and another point I have is, well, if we can go in and look at the file, you must redact the ID number at that point. So it doesn't make sense to me why the planning department wouldn't redact the, um, the tax ID numbers and put them on the website. To me, that is when you really have transparency, when you can stay at home and look on the web. Because they, apparently they did that for a while. I saw some projects, they were there completely. There was a complete final account <coughs> there, uh, some small projects. But then it started to change just in the last few years. Okay, Marley, are you speaking so, that's a for or against Sorry. repealing the CPA? <coughs> right now, this question? Yeah. I'm speaking to reform the CPA. I think. Um, so, so, the only I way, if I'm on the committee, that it could be reformed is if it's still there. Okay. But what I noticed in the beginning, whenever someone asked the mayor, the mayor said, for or against? That was the entire question. For or against? It was a for or against conversation. The same with the, the councillor candidates. Um, Bill Newman said, we're going to talk about the CPA. And so he asked Bill Dwight, are you for or against? And Bill said, of course I'm for it. And that was the end of the conversation. So what I am so impressed about this is that we're here to talk about it. And I just didn't want people to leave and say, well, why did Marlene make this thing up about the accounting being, it can be improved. And I just, I don't know how I can put that into a question to you. But do you agree that we can improve it, you know, without people being alienated by the thought of, well, you know, why is she asking this question? But well, we can certainly let people address that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So would you like to address the question of can the CPA be improved, or would you like to Probably begin? Would you like to start? Yeah. Yes. I, uh, like I said, I, I started off uh, when it first came around, I voted against it. I will admit it has done some good things, but it also has left me lacking uh, it, it's gotten me to a point where I, I don't think it should be in there anymore. If it is voted out, it can always be brought back in a year, and perhaps at a 1% rate. If the economy is going the way it's been going, it, it would be good to get 1%. And perhaps reforms, reforms in it. Um, I worry about if, if somebody gets money from a CPA, says they're going to do a project, and from what I know, there, from what I've seen, uh, there isn't a, a final accounting where they can say, look, this is everything we've done. Um, I would say that the city should be able to put a lien against that property to whoever owns it and say, look, you didn't use the money. You, you have to pay that back. And if you don't pay it back, you, you have a lien that you'll have to settle when you sell. Um, so I, I do see, I would like to see it voted up now if it's brought back in a year with different conditions, perhaps at that point the economy is a little bit better, people will be a little bit better off to be able to afford it uh, and bring it back in a year or two years. I mean, when it was put in place, it was said, this, you know, this doesn't have to be forever, it can be repealed in the future. And uh, perhaps it's time to take a break and, and uh, look at other things we need to do in our community. You have 28 seconds. Do you want to say anything else? Sure. I guess uh, I'd like to say that I, I think the reform needs to happen at the state level. I mean, I think there's really some critical issues with where the money's coming from and where it's going. But I'd just like to throw something very simple out there, which is between the years 2002 and 2006, more than 50% of the funding from the state CPA pool went to Middlesex County, the eastern part of the state. for you guys? So just speaking quickly to the fiscal kind of controls, um, the CPC doesn't serve for, as the clerk of the works. If you're familiar with any big construction projects, who's ever signed that contract, they're really responsible for the deliverables. Um, the city has great auditing practices in place. The city writes a contract with the, who's ever been awarded the money 
and the city then follows up with them just as they would with any vendor who sells road salt or builds a bridge. Um, the CPC doesn't play that role. Could the practices be um, perhaps improved? Sure. And there's uh, ample opportunities for anybody from the public to come and suggest those improvements and have that discussion with the members of the CPC twice a week on Wednesdays. There's a public comment period. So bring your questions there. That would be a real appropriate place and see if they're followed through with. So that's part of your answer, I think. And I would just want to respond to Jesus that the, that the reforms, is that how much? Quickly. The reforms are already happening. They're, they're already in motion at the state level. And the numbers have already changed since that period between 2000 and 2006. A number of communities, more communities have adopted CPA, which have lower income levels. So the landscape has already changed since then. I, yes. Ready? Okay. Yes. I have, I have a question for the no table. Before Northampton adopted CPA, was there that kind of similar leveraging of public funds from Northampton and from outside that you say now has come with the CPA? Um, you know, I can only speak to some of the topics that are covered by the CPA. I know a little bit about historic preservation. I know a bit more about land conservation. Um, there is some leveraging, certainly, you know, available, but I don't think anything at the scale that we're talking about now. Um, there are very few dedicated funding sources to the types of projects that are covered by the CPA. That's one of the reasons why the CPA was first enacted. Towns always had these projects come up. The tough, tough questions, what happens when the town hall is falling apart? What happens when that iconic farm is about to be sold off and people want to keep it? And everyone ran around trying to find the money. It was very, very difficult. It just often wasn't there. So the law was really enacted in order to, you know, to address that, those recurring problems in communities. Um, so yes, no, I, I, I really don't think the leveraging, you know, the, the possibility of leveraging was anywhere near as much as it is now. Getting that initial kick, um, and that's in a part of the CPA. Funders like to see that the community is investing in a project before they want to come in and back it. So this is a way for us saying, look, this, is a, this project is important to the community, and that's where the leveraging comes from. Um, well said, Mark. I think the only times that I had experience with it before 2005, 2006 were through the, like the Capital Improvements Committee. If in fact they needed a couple of dump trucks and there was some federal money available for that, the city would need to pony up some money early on. And all of that was squeezed into all the other projects that came out of the Capital Improvements Committee. And if you've been following the city budget in the past five years, that pot of money has just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. So we didn't have that those opportunities to pitch in like we had in the past, so. Uh, yeah, just, just recently, and I've seen it in the past, and um, the recent one I saw was the city put up money for Turkey Hill Road and guaranteed the money would be there. And when the grant was received from the state, the money then went to Jackson Street School for capital improvements. So that's a process that the city's been using for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Ed? Um, uh, several years ago, I uh, heard a, um, a definition of democracy, and uh, maybe you all have heard it. It was a uh, democracy is the um, the uh, Uh, um, <coughs> I can't believe I can't get that word. Um, well, never mind. Uh, that's uh, uh, beside the point, I guess. Um, one of the things that is, concerns me about this, um, or, right now we're in a period of time where uh, particularly the people who like are on uh, Social Security, um, you know, they've been two years without any increases. And, uh, you know, I, when I go to the grocery store and I look at a loaf of bread for uh, you know, almost $5, 
and uh, everything else is, you know, goes right along with that. And I think there are a lot of people who are struggling, but they may be on that borderline where they still are not exempt from this, uh, you know, the, uh, so um, I think that that's something that we have to consider in this. And uh, I'm hoping that a lot of people in the city, a lot of people I talk to, they, they, they don't have the right attitude about voting and they say, oh, they're going to do whatever they want to do. And I, and I just try to tell them, well, they're going to do it if you let them do it. And um, anyway, another thing I looked at uh, today uh, was the Academy of Music. And um, I'm looking at, uh, it was uh, $230,000 to um, restore the marquee and uh, put in three double front doors and uh, two single side uh, egress doors. And um, that seems like a lot of money for that. I mean, how much does a door cost? I mean, even if you charge, even if you paid $1,000 for each door, you only talk about $5,000. And that leaves, uh, $225,000 for the marquee. Uh, I mean, that's, we're talking about a quarter of a million dollars for, to, to replace a couple of doors and put up some uh, lights and bulbs for the marquee on the thing. So I don't know how close that's being monitored, but that, it seems like we're paying a lot of money for some of these things. I don't know what's going on there. And the other thing that concerns me also is, like with the DPW, um, they, got, they want to redo that whole building, or I don't remember the figures, but it was like 18 million or whatever to do the, the uh, barns. And uh, I made a comment about this at the uh, city council. Uh, I mean, it, because they said the, that the city barns were built in uh, 1895, and just by sheer coincidence, my house was built in 1895. And there's nothing wrong with my house. If I have a clapboard that's going to fall off, I'll actually get a nail and actually bang it in and, and, and put that clapboard back up there. But the city seems to be in a, a mode of let it go to hell and then let's get a, a small or a Taj Mahal here instead. I mean, some of their concerns were uh, okay. exhaust fumes getting the, the uh, workers there. and. You know, I'm sure you all have been had your uh, car inspected where they pull it into a garage and they put a hose on it to run the exhaust out of the garage. And there's a lot of common sense things in the, uh, that article that was in the Gazette. They're showing uh, shingles and all that deteriorating. Well, for God's sake, put some new ones on. I mean, we don't oh, have okay. to. Okay, and uh, we, we really are not in a position here to talk about the DPW. Um, okay, but, yeah, but, 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 but did you have a question about the Academy of Music that you would like to have addressed? Well, yeah, could anybody, yeah. Uh, could anybody explain to me why yeah. it was that kind of a figure for us? Sure. Uh, so shall I ask? So I, I was on the CPC yeah. at that point in time that um, there was, it was um, a large project. I think they came before us once and they were denied and then they came back again for a subsequent round. Um, because they hadn't done their due diligence around getting estimates for that work. They actually had two phases of that work, I believe. Um, one was for doors and windows to, to try to keep their heating bill down. Um, and that's something the CPC looks at very closely. If in fact you show us that by this investment of the money, you're going to save money down the road and recoup those earnings, that's a bonus. And I think we'd all agree on that. Um, the marquee was really compared with other marquees of comparable theaters around the country to see what was effective and what was working. The doors, you know, as, and again, I can't get into too many specifics. We don't have that paperwork in front of us. But the doors in a public building like that, emergency doors, are very much different than our doors in our, in our homes. Um, and because of the age of the building, when they were retrofitting doors and windows, so much of that trim work and the masonry work also had to be redone at that time. It's, it's just a much more complicated project with a building of that old and that stone and masonry. Um, so that, all of those costs kind of come together to, to produce a pretty big ticket project. 
Um, but again, the, op the option was if we don't do that, then the Academy of Music gets shuttered, and in time it falls into disrepair, and then we lose it for our children and our grandchildren. Um, so the CPC felt like it was a great investment at that time. Do you all like to comment? Yeah. Sure. Uh, back in 99, I ran for mayor here, and uh, I lost in the primary. Glad I did. I've been a lot of responsibility. But uh, one of my ideas I had come up with at that time <coughs> was to do a raffle ticket. Now, there's uh, six box seats in the Academy. Lousy for viewing the stage, but well, for viewing movies. Uh, it's more to be seen than, than to see from. Uh, but what I had thought about at that time was, was doing raffle tickets, 4,000 raffle tickets, you know, $10 a piece, uh, three for 20. And I had, all the numbers worked out, it was going to be between $33,000 to $40,000 a year that they could have done this every year, and it would have been for all shows, all movies. Um, people look at the CPA as a way of funding things, such as the repairs of the academy, but there's other ideas they could do to generate that same kind of money. And from 99 till now, there would have been no, well over 400 something thousand, 480,000 dollars that they would have had toward to do repairs. Um, real quick, I brought it up with Dwayne Robinson, uh, I think that was his name then, and uh, he had said, well, yeah, we thought about auctioning them off. I said, the problem is it goes to the richest and the highest bidder. <laughs> A family of four can afford 20 bucks for a chance at some tickets to go to the academy for a whole year's worth of entertainment. Things like that, even as a CPA thing, you could put that in as a requirement. Find ways to do fundraising around these things. Okay, thank you. Another question? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, my name's Susco. I live on Bridge Road. Uh, I'd like to look at the 79-hour uh, average uh, assessment in a little different way. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I got over the summer. I got a brochure from the uh, the family farm situation down the street here, and it, as part of it, they indicated they were going to get money from the CBA appropriated so that they could uh, establish water sources and provide water for the plots down there, and. Uh, I looked at that and I said, wow, I wonder how that compares to my own situation. And uh, when I first retired, uh, I was filling my property and, and, and providing myself with a larger area, which I had hoped to be a garden. And when I first retired, I, I bought myself a pair of overalls and got a, and got a, uh, uh, <laughs> and I, be I became the farmer, and the first thing I noticed is, wow, irrigating is expensive. And being the uh, the frugal person I am, and, and and being a technical person, and I monitor uh, and I track all my expenses, I noticed that the water expense was extremely high and getting higher every year. So uh, at one point. Uh, I do a yearly assessment and I eliminate those things that I find to be inefficient and sucking up my money that I could spend on beer or something else. And uh, so I did eliminate it. And believe it or not, it was around $86 for my little plot that I started with. And I plan had planned to go to a half an acre. And uh, so when I, the point is that I'm paying, I'm going to be paying for the water for people in the community farm. And I've eliminated it from my budget. And uh, so why? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to pay for other people's irrigation? Okay. Um, do you all want to begin on that one? I think that you might be misinformed a little bit. And from what I understand, the community farm is going to be a well. If I'm correct, uh, it was a shallow well that was planned at one time, and it'll be taking water from the Mill River watershed. What and the Mill River watershed is determines whether or not we're on a water restriction. So when the water is low, and of course if the community farms are taking more water, we'll be on water restrictions a lot earlier in July next year, I believe. 
but the real water is going to go into the athletic fields. I think that's where their water main and their uh, purified water from Haight up in Whateley. guys want to comment on this? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not going to speak to the grow food thing. I'm not familiar with that project or what they plan to do with the water. Um, I think there's a lot of work that has to be done by engineers and folks in the city to do that. Um, I will speak just to that the, the people who um, pay into the CPA are doing it for because they live in a community like Northampton. Um, the same reason that people pay for the schools even though they don't have children in the schools. The same reason that I'll pay for a new DPW building because, um, and I don't use it 24-7, but it's needed in our community. And so I'm, I'm willing and my friends are willing to invest in our community even though we don't see a direct return. So. I think we're going to have one more question. So let's, uh, yes. I have uh, two technical questions, so I hope I can squeeze them both in. Uh, one is on page two in the uh, income limits and who is a senior. Um, I wondered what the age limit was and are those items established by the state or part of the local CPA? So that's my first question. Okay, I think you want me to answer that? These are, these are, um, John, would you, would you answer yeah, that? I can talk a little bit about, um, there is an exemption, and actually there's no age limit. It is the people that domicile in the house, not whose names on the property, well, you have to be the owner of the house, obviously, but, um, say you have a man and a wife and a, and, your sister and your brother, so that would be four people. And then there's, so you list on this third page the income of each person that domiciles in the house. Right here, this would be one person, the next person. If you had four, you'd fill out all the columns. Um, there is a range, and I think maybe she shows it in that. It's, um, so the seniors, they say 60 or older, and so like for two people, those two people can earn up to 55440 if you're over 60. If you're under, under 60, two people could earn 44352 There is one thing we've been helping people, especially the older people, if you go over on the income, go over in the income down here, you can list your medical expenses on page two, right here, like your insurance and the things you spent to buy medical things, if it's oxygen or your pharmacy, you can list it here. So that may help somebody that's just over just a little bit, let's say maybe, maybe your expenses are 1500 you can subtract that from your total income at the bottom. It's really, really easy to fill out. I mean, <clears throat> this asks for your birth certificate, but we don't we don't require that. We figure you're gonna be honest about your age. And uh, so there's a few questions about yourself. And um, this is the important part to make sure, say you're under the fifty five thousand if you're over sixty, you add these together. And um, it will delete the um, CPA from your tax bill. You won't, you'll see it taken off in January on the actual bill. We also have um, exemptions called 41C for the seniors. You have to be 70 to qualify for that, and there's an income limit and an estate limit. You don't have to count your house, but it's $650 off your tax bill. And the thing of it is that eliminates you from paying the CPA. So uh, if you're getting that 41C, you automatically have that CPA taken off. So, and we allow this, like, the actual bill will go out in January, and we'll allow three months after that, January, February, March, for people who want to sign up for this or even exemptions. 
And once you get this, we've been um, mailing the applications each year to the people. Thank you very much, Joe. Just, to, uh, just yeah. to clarify, people can walk into your office, Joan, and get help with that they worksheet. Do it every day. Yep. Right. Thank you. And sometimes it's surprising. They started to leave, and I. I just said, well, um, by the way, you get an exemption, and we were able to give give them an elderly exemption, which really made their day. Thanks. Can I make a comment? Uh, your office is very, very helpful to a lot of people. Oh, I thank you. It. We're happy. We're happy to do that. There's four of us, and uh, we can all we can all pitch in depending upon who's there. We have more girls. It's just a half a day, but we're happy to help. Okay, Peg, did you have a yeah, my second part was uh, on the CPC and the role you play. Uh, primarily, <coughs> you accept applications, determine eligibility, uh, you review the projects and see are they good quality projects, well documented and well proposed and all of those things. Uh, you deny or approve them. The approval goes to the mayor and then to the city council. Uh, in terms of the actual expenditures and things that really happen afterwards, is the CPC involved in that process or is that a matter of city government and should the CPC be involved in that process, I guess, to make sure that what was proposed is what in fact happens, I guess. Uh, just a clarification. Asks for any changes or asks for an extension that has to go back to the CPC for approval. But otherwise, as George explained, the contract goes ahead through the regular city processes, the bidding and the, the contracting and all of that. Okay, so only if there's a major change. If, no, any, any any change. Any change yeah. at all. Okay, I'm going to give each side a final two minutes, and we'll start this time with the no's, since we started at the beginning with the yeses, and you guys will get the final word. Two minutes to say whatever else you need to say. Okay, I'll take one minute. Um, I really want to thank everybody for coming. I'm kind of looking through the room here, and I'm just, again, so proud to be able to say I live in Northampton, to have someone like Joan who comes down after a day of work to explain things to us to hear from Dave that their office is helpful. It's great. And I think the CPC is another reason why people want to move to Northampton, why people want to stay in Northampton, because it allows our community to not only keep growing, but to preserve what's really good about the place. So vote no next Tuesday. Okay. Please. Are we gonna go oh, do you, oh, do you want the rest of your time? Yes, okay. You have you have a few more. Yeah. Okay. Have another minute. <laughs> um, I just want to thank again everyone for coming out tonight. Um, the gentleman in the audience was making a comment about democracy, and I think, you know, it's a wonderful thing that we're reconsidering this and we're stopping to look back. And I know, I, I could guess that every organization, every individual who has been involved in the CBA project is proud of that project and is proud to put that project forward uh, as a result of what the CPA can bring to our community. Um, I just want to add a lot of most people have also brought up the hard economic times, and that's certainly true and something we're all dealing with. Uh, these issues don't go away during hard economic times. And, you know, the CPA gives us some creativity. I've known some communities around the state who have actually come up with, the, in terms of the affordable housing portion of it, not coming up with affordable housing units, but establishing a mortgage or rental assistance program for their town just to get help them get through tough economic times like this. So it's really an amazingly flexible resource. Uh, that out of the local control and the leveraging, I think it's just you know, really a win all around for our city. Okay. So oh, vote now. Okay. Yes. Just want to say that uh, vote yes on question one. There is a lot of questions that are out there on the state level. One that you just pointed out about being uh, flexible, and it's time the city sit back for a couple of years. I hope we maintain a commission with no money and come back with some broader ideas in two years. I think people are in very bad economical times. There's so much uncertainty in this city. The Board of Public Works building up there. I mean, 
I mean, CPC money, or CPA money could be used for an old trolley barn for rehab. Because it says rehab on here. But these are the kind of ideas we have to go by. More broader range of things. It's too much tunnel vision at this point. So vote yes, get it off for two years, and I'll be glad to come back in two years and vote yes to bring it back again with the right ideas. I just want to say thank you all for showing up. If I've changed some minds, great. If I haven't, I'm glad you took the time and were patient and understood that we aren't we aren't just anti 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 people. We're we're just our own people with our own concerns to it. I thank you for showing up and uh, thank you Paradise City Forum and everybody else that has something to do with it. <laughs> thank you, folks. Yes, I'd like to say thank you too for everybody coming out here, despite that we just had a really bad storm and some people might not even have power yet. Um, I feel like there's a lot of focus on things like the CPA and how much good they can do. But I think we're forgetting sometimes reality. And I'd just like to briefly read something from The Republican. Um, this is an article um, about uh, the state should pay the costs for, um, well, I'll just read it. Um, there are 268 school-aged children living in hotels and motels in western Massachusetts. Holyoke and Chicopee have some of the largest numbers of homeless students, with 74 and 94 respectively. Transporting homeless students cost the Holyoke schools $358,000 last year, 617 students counted as homeless. I, not much has changed at the state level in terms of the CPA. Holyoke, Chicopee, Springfield, Boston, Worcester, Pittsfield have still not adopted it. They're thinking about other things. And we really, I think the CPA is really taking away focus even in our community from the things that we really need to be looking at, whether it's how we're going to deal with the landfill issue, affordability in this community, um, road infrastructure, economic development. And we're accepting and are really grateful for a very small portion of what is mostly our own tax base to use to fund these projects. I'm just, I guess I'm getting frustrated. <laughs> but um, thank you anyway for coming out here. I really appreciate it. Okay, then. And Thank you for moderating. My pleasure. Great job. Thank I don't know how you keep driving. I don't need to. Thanks, everybody.